Doha's defiance. Qatar snubs Saudi Arabia by restoring ties with Iran. Will this reshape the region? I'm Imran Garta and today's newsmaker is Qatar. Doha and Tehran. These capitals are around a thousand kilometers apart, but in the diplomatic world, they're getting closer by the day. It's one of the key reasons several Gulf nations say they cut ties with Qatar. They accused the country of being too cozy with Iran. So 12 weeks ago, they enforced a crippling blockade. But if their plan was to get Qatar to reject Iran, it spectacularly backfired. Instead, Doha has now sent its ambassador back to Tehran to restore full diplomatic ties. They hadn't had representation there for almost two years. So how will this shift in ties impact deepening rifts in the Gulf? We begin our debate with this report from Yvette McCullough. An act of defiance by Doha, going against the demands of its estranged friends by cozying up to their foe. Qatar has announced it is restoring full diplomatic relations with Iran and reinstating its ambassador. It issued this statement expressing its aspirations to strengthen bilateral relations with Iran in all fields. Qatar withdrew its ambassador in 2016 in solidarity with its ally, Saudi Arabia. After its embassy in Tehran was stormed by people protesting Saudi's execution of a prominent Shia cleric. But it seems Doha's sense of solidarity has worn thin. Qatar has been in crisis since June 5th, when Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Bahrain and Egypt cut diplomatic ties. Accusing it of funding terrorism, being too close to Iran, and of meddling in the internal affairs of other countries. They enforced a punitive boycott, blocking their land, sea and air routes to Qatar, saying the blockade would only be lifted if Qatar met a list of 13 demands, which includes closing Al Jazeera and cutting all ties with Iran. Qatar and Iran have strong economic links, sharing a huge offshore natural gas field, and Iran has come to Qatar's aid, sending supplies and opening its airspace. After nearly three months of the blockade, it seemed the GCC crisis had lapsed into a stalemate. But the UAE's foreign minister has warned that Qatar's latest move has escalated its troubles, tweeting that the management of the crisis caused the burning of bridges, the squandering of sovereignty and the deepening of the Qatari crisis and undermined what remained of the mediator's chances. The wisdom that we hoped for was completely absent. The ultimatum of Saudi Arabia and its allies appears to have been a miscalculation, with Qatar signalling it's willing to go its own way. And now that push has come to shove, are Qatar and Iran being pushed closer together? Yvette McCullough, The Newsmakers. Well, to debate this, I'm joined by Mahjoub Zouairi. He's a Middle East history professor with the Gulf Studies program at Qatar University. He also has a PhD from Tehran University. And for the view from the other side, we have Hisham al Ghannam. He's a fellow at Saudi Arabia's King Faisal Center for Research and Islamic Studies. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. Mahjoub Zouairi, the foreign minister of the UAE says this decision to restore ties with Iran quote, embarrasses Qatar. Does it embarrass Qatar? As an observer, I, s I look at this relations, I look at this uh, Qatari step as part of the, the right for any country for its sovereignty to make a decision about its own foreign policy. Uh, two years uh, in the context of uh, Saudi Arab-led coalition, uh, Qatar has decided to withdraw its embassy because the, there is a commitment of being part of this coalition. As the Qatari troops are asked to withdraw from this military operation, what's so-called decisive storm, um, it seems that uh, Qataris saw it as there is no reason to stay, um, to keep their ambassador out of Tehran, especially Tehran was positive to uh, help um, or to show a good willingness to help Qatar on this um, uh, uh, sanction imposed on, on uh, the blockade imposed on Qatar by uh, its own neighbor. So basically, it is. Um, I think it is the right for the country to decide about its own foreign policy, regardless what the others believe mm -hmm. on it. Hisham, sovereign nation deciding on its foreign policy. 
with a nation that's its neighbor and also a nation that it shares economic interests with, including a very large, the largest in the world, gas field. They have a right to do it, right, Hisham? No, I don't think so. I think, I think what, what your guest from uh, Doha just said, with all due respect, is, um, is, uh, is utter nonsense. Uh, Qatar is not, is not Cuba during the Bay of Pigs invasion, and it's not the current North Korea. Uh, Qatar is under the U.S. security umbrella, and it's a, it's a, it's a monarchy. Uh, I, thus, I think, I think that this is um, a tactical move than a strategic one. The goal is to send a message to the boycotting uh, neighbors of Qatar that, uh, that the Qataris are, uh, are, are going into uh, the Iranian orbit and aligning with Iran. Uh, honestly, I want to ask, I wanna ask your, your distinguished guest from Doha. Will, will, will Qatar, will the, will the Qatari money that will be funneled to Iran, will it be used to support the, the Shia death squads in Iraq and Syria? Will it, will it be used to kill the Muslims in Syria? Uh, honestly, I, say, honestly I, think, I think this is a tactical move. I do not believe, personally, that Qatar will move into this alignment. Okay, you had this a question. This will risk the regime okay. itself. Certainly. I do think that the U.S. is the main guarantor for the Qatar regime. I okay, mean, so let's trying use... Trying to play with this is very critical. C certainly, and the U.S. is also a main guarantor for the Saudis and other GCC countries. Sure, but, but the Saudis are hegemon in the region. Certainly. It's, it's, it's totally different than a city-state such okay. as Qatar, a small and tiny nation. Okay, but who am I to judge who's big and small and who deserves more respect than others? But yes. you had a question for Mahjoub. Mahjoub, is Qatar's deal with Iran going to support Iran's foreign policy interests in the region? It's a fair, it's a fair question. Uh, Iran's involved uh, in Syria. Uh, you know, a lot I, of people I are speak, unhappy with uh, what's you know, happening in Syria. Mahjoub? I mean, I, I speak as an academic who's expert in the region. I don't think so that Qatar, uh, its own foreign policy is affected by Iranian foreign policy. Qatar has a major issue with the Iranian foreign policy when it comes to Syria. But there is a way to manage your relations even with your um, uh, enemy. It's not that really, if, if, if Qatar and Iran had a problem over Syria, it doesn't mean that they should have a crisis which basically led to confrontation. There is a way how you manage your relations. I mean, um, Saudis managed their relations with Iran from 1997 until 2004. Um, at that time, the nuclear issue was on the table. The UK, France, and Germany were discussing Iran about their nuclear issue. And Saudi Arabia had the strong ties with Iran. Um, can anyone object that or can anyone question that? It is the right for Saudi Arabia to, to build its relation. When they decided can to I interrupt their Imran? embassy and they close their Come ambassador. In. Yeah, for, for the, it's, for it's the sake of the right. argument, I will, I, will accept, I will accept what, da, what, what your guest from Doha just said, that Saudi Arabia is, is seeking um, um, a deal of Iran. Let's, let's accept this. I, this, is, this, is very, this is qualitatively different than a, a relationship, an individual relationship that the Qataris are seeking. When, when a hegemon such as Saudi uh, tries to strike a grand deal and, and bring peace to the region, this is quite different than a small state such as Qatar uh, tries to infiltrate the, the, the GCC uh, and, and, the Arab, and, the, and this Arab coalition with an Iranian, with an, with a, with an Iranian um, uh, influence. I think this is totally different, and, and, and we're comparing apples and oranges here. It's not fair to compare any relationship between, let's say, Saudi and the GCC as a Iranian whole, and between Qatar and between Iranian Qatar and Iran. I, st I, st I still ask the same question. Will Qatar support the death squads as, as, as they did okay, when, they pay, point, when they pay recklessly the okay, ransom, the point, ransom to the Shia, Iranian the Shia militias that hold the hostages? Iranian influence, because, because uh, the Saudi Arabia in particular have not done enough to play its own role as, as, as a Muslim country led in the Gulf. That more of the experts now, they say... Yeah, now Saudi is trying to correct, to correct what happened. Why because the size small of the states, storm should not stay from the day one. Why Saudi Arabia with fire. was the nearest Arab Spring? Why Saudi Arabia was not helping the... The, 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 this is, the this is can I interrupt him, right? This is, this is, this is not a secret. This, I mean, Saudi Arabia this, is always with the status quo. Things, regardless of the regime that exists. Tomorrow, Saudi Arabia is always with the status quo. 
don't speak as unlike a Muslim, which is recklessly. Gentlemen, we're at the point where you're both talking at exactly the same time. This is the country you are defending. I am not defending Qatar. Qatar has its own people to defending. I am an observer. I am an observer looking at things differently. I look at I look at 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 what's happening now. No, I don't think you're an observer. You work for a Qatar university. You receive a huge salary, Dr. Zouhairi. You're not an observer. I do not get any money from the Saudi government. Second to come in here, we can take a breath. Done enough to stop Iranian influence. Iranian influence because of the weaknesses of oh, Arab. Okay, Iran Mahjoub, is like other, the third Mahjoub, world give me a second. Third world nation. Okay, Mahjoub, so wait, give me a second. Can Hisham, let me ask you. Hold on, Hisham. So sure. we talk about symbolism, right? You say this is a, a, a symbolic move by the Qataris with the Iranians. It's a way yes. at maybe thumbing their noses at the GCC, which has had them under blockade. Sure, you say it might not be Cuba in the 1960s, but it's a blockade nonetheless. What about the symbolism? from the Saudis. On the surface of things, the Hajj easing of visas or restrictions seem to be a good thing. But then they parade a man who's the brother of an ousted emir from 1972. Essentially, what they're trying to tell the Qataris is, hey, we've got our guy that we want to replace the emir of Qatar with, and we're going to do it in, at any time of, of our desire. We're going to parade him, and we're can going to show you that we're going to push for a coup d'etat. What about the symbolism of that? Tell me, Hisham. Can I, can I answer? Can I answer? First, first, these are boycotting states. It's not a blockade. Let, let's, let's be clear on that. Secondly, Saudi did not say anything clearly about this. This is the, this is the signal that Qataris picked up. Uh, it, it, it appears that there are different heads for the Qatar regime. They Saudi did not say that. They plucked the guy out of absolute the place nowhere. Regime. He Let was me continue, irrelevant Saudi for did not 45 say years. He was irrelevant for 45 years. They plucked him out of nowhere. Was he irrelevant? Did the Qatari government say he did not, he, he represented or doesn't represent it? He acts he acts as a Qatari he has, as a Qatari citizen. He he did not Saudi did not claim that they want to replace the current regime, the current Qatari regime. They did not say that. This is what the Qataris are claiming. It's not the Saudis. And back to your main point, this is this is quite different than when Qatar tries to to blackmail its neighbors by a relationship with Iran. Now, I think this, this will not work. Okay. At, so at, let me, at let the me end ask of the Mahjoub. day, Mahjoub. Saudi, when, they, when, Saudi, the, okay. when the Saudis... You say it's blackmail. And, when and, the Saudi boycotted Qatar, they knew okay. what's coming. Let me they take your point. Qatar Hisham. is not playing underneath the table. Or where. Sadly, and actually, let me take your point and expand Qatar, on it. with this open relationship with Iran, they proved what the, what the accusations okay. of the boycotting okay. states were from the beginning. Okay, so let me ask Mahjoub. What the other states said. Okay, so Mahjoub, right? You have the Qataris saying, we were hacked. The Emir didn't say these nice things about Iran and relations with Tehran. And it might be true that the Qataris were hacked. There's a lot of evidence that suggests that the Qataris were hacked. Yes. But now that when it yes. restores ties with Tehran, it seems as if the details of what was in that hack turned out to be true. That those things that were said about Tehran, the Qataris actually meant it. Do you, do you see that no, perhaps please, people please would different. read it that way? No, 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 no. Let's differentiate. Let's differentiate. At the end of the day, no one needs to sing how much Iran is, a, is an amazing nation. This is a decision done by the Qatari authorities that we have a withdraw ambassador for two years because we are committing to the Saudi Arab coalition to, um, uh, coalition to fight uh, uh, Houthis and restore the legitimacy or legitimate government in Yemen. Now we are out of this uh, uh, coalition. We have the right to decide about our foreign policy. Now, this, this is obvious. This is an ABC, very clear. Like, the, say, this is the sun. I mean, I don't see it. Why, is, why, why there is a why Yeah, there it's, is it's, it's a very clear when you support the Arab, Arab coalition however, in the war however, of Yemen, however, then suddenly, the issue, uh, what the issue is, then the suddenly, issue is, uh, the Arab the coalition becomes is, a criminal coalition. The issue suddenly. is, and a, and a day the and night. Is, this, this, the this issue is, this is, this is a hedge. prime example. And a clear normally, example of the Qatari policy is, in the last 20 years. Hisham, let the man finish his point. I wish, as, as a part of I wish, the I wish if Qatar activity, had the neutral the position of Kuwait and Oman. No, 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 Hisham, no, no, Hisham, let the man finish his point. Old years. All countries are, all, 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 all
are going there because they're doing this activity once Muslims in their are life. killed in Syria so and Iraq, now, Dr. Zawahiri. I know that personally you cannot condemn this on air. I know personally that you, you cannot are condemn shouting. this on this air. Is not, this is not, this is not, a, you are shouting. You, I, I wish, wish you, you can, can condemn, you, you, I, should, I wish you can condemm the Iranian acts in Syria and Iraq, 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 This is not true. I personally respect you, Dr. Zawahiri. Say whatever you want. This is not the way how to Muslims in Syria and Iraq. I don't know why you would do to be respected. Mahjoub, let me, let me ask Hisham a question. You can shout. Okay, let me ask. He can shout a lot. Certainly. Mahjoub, let me, sorry, I'm sorry let to me say ask this. He's shouting for nonsense. Uh, I understand. Me, and Hisham, let, you are, you are filibustering. But let me, let me ask you a question, if you could listen for, for 10 seconds here, right? So, you mentioned Shia death squads. They are Sunni death squads. The region's a complete mess. The, the region is an absolute disaster at the moment. And Absolutely. a lot of people blame the Iranians for, for, for meddling and getting involved and so on. I'm not here to debate that. But maybe, Hisham, by the Qataris sure. having full diplomatic ties with the Iranians, mm -hmm. maybe they're the bridge that the rest of the GCC countries need to talk to Tehran to maybe put an end to this sectarianism and bloodshed in the region. Maybe, maybe well, that's I, the way it should be I done. I, I, I mean, I, I, nothing I, else I has worked, Ambran, Hisham. You're, you're... I think, I think you're being sarcastic, Amran. I'm, I'm sure you're I'm not being sarcastic. sarcastic. What else is no wrong? One, no one, no one, no Amran, 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 you work in Qatar. You know, you know, you know, you know for good that this is a city state. It's a small nation that cannot influence or change the, the policies of a big state and a hegemon in the region, such as the, such as the Iranian regime. This doesn't happen in international relations. So no, why are they being boycotted? Qatar could be swallowed. Qatar could be swallowed easily by, by, by the Iranians, not, not, not the opposite. So why hasn't, why, why why hasn't, the, Saudi, why hasn't the Saudi blockade worked sorry, then? I'm sorry Hisham, to say, why hasn't the Saudi blockade worked then? This doesn't that's, see that's the realities. A, it's working. This is small I, I, state. We, we this would is expect it to, to, to work, to work in a short period of time. To this will take time. Nations everybody to everybody that started the boycott knows that. And this could take years. Give us a second. Mahjoub, give us a Look at what Germany did. He's interrupting me now. Mahjoub, look at all of that. Mahjoub, you're doing to him what he did to you. Singapore is a small state. Mahjoub, hold on. Mahjoub, you're doing to him what he did to you. What yes. he did to you. Hisham, yes. 10 seconds, finish your answer, and then Mahjoub, I'll give you the final word. Hisham. Sure. Everybody that started the boycott know, every state that was involved in this boycott know that this could take years, not, not, not days and months. So it will work at the end of the day. The current situation is not sustainable for the Qataris. Everybody knows that, including the Qataris. If this wasn't true, Qatar will take the, the neutral position of Kuwait and Oman, and it wouldn't have an open relationships with Iran and risk its regime, the regime itself in Qatar. Uh, at, at the end of the day, I, I think, I think, I think this, this boycott have, have proven what, what these states, uh, Saudi, UAE, Egypt, and Bahrain, have, have stated from the beginning that Qataris are, uh, are, are playing with fire in the region, are, are, uh, are, being, are being aligned with Iran. This is what the Qataris actually okay. did now in the open. Th okay. And I think this is, the, this is the main intention of these states. It's, it's, a, it's not a surprise for them. Okay. And they, they were not shocked by the Qatari actions okay, after Hisham. the boycott. Okay, so Mahjoub, I have to wrap. So I'm going to give you the final word. Come in. Yes. I think it's obvious that, uh, you know, the, the, the country participated in the blockade were hurted more than Everything Qatar. Bloomberg reports and other reports confirm the fact that, that this blockade has been affected badly, uh, affected badly the other countries other than Qatar. I mean, Qatar... Uh, how is it obvious? To what I'm how is reading, it obvious? Everything is obvious for they the are following the, They are looking at this as a long term, and they have a plan B and C. According to all, all of these reports, they are doing very I well. Wish, I, I wish, I wish, Dr. Zouari. I sincerely wish that. To, respect, to, to move on. Um, I think, according to the trust, they are full confident of, of what they are doing. All of the measures have been taken. I think the world, most of the modern world, is looking with, re, with a lot of respect to where, what they are doing, opening their arms to cooperate with Qatar, which I think others, they should look at this seriously. Mahjoub Zawari and Hisham al Ghannam, gentlemen, I thank you for joining us. Still ahead on the newsmakers, the world's oldest leader is not done yet. We go to Zimbabwe, where Robert Mugabe is gearing up to fight for another election. And India bans Muslims from instant divorce. Is it a win for women's rights? Or are separate laws for religious minorities now under threat? All 
All this week, we'll be bringing you exclusive reports from Zimbabwe as the country enters campaign mode ahead of next year's election. The 93-year-old president shows no signs of handing over power. Young voters have known no other leader than Robert Mugabe, who's only tightened his grip on power since taking office three and a half decades ago. Now the country's economy is collapsing and its politics are dominated by the scramble for succession within the ruling ZANU-PF party and the opposition. Could this election spell the end for Mugabe? Sandra Gatman has this report from the capital, Harare. Shunned by the West and exalted by his party faithful, President Robert Mugabe is one of the world's most intriguing leaders still around. At home, he's closely guarded and protected. But the newsmakers got a chance to see the man up close. To many, Robert Mugabe symbolizes freedom from colonial rule. I'm free, I can walk all over. The effort to liberate the citizens of this country. These days, his speech and his steps are slow and careful. But Mugabe is clinging on. President Robert Mugabe is still seen as a hero to his supporters. But even members of his party, the ruling ZANU-PF, have a burning question. Who will succeed the 93-year-old leader? For 30 years, Mugabe and his party, ZANU-PF, have built an entrenched and towering presence across the country. But without a successor, intrigue and infighting may threaten the party from within. We have witnessed an escalation in as much as factionalism and factional wars. There are allegedly two factions within ZANPF. The one is reportedly led by Emerson Mnangagwa, who happens to be vice president and also President Robert Mugabe's top confidence. These guys are from the army. Then you also have the other faction allegedly being spearheaded by the first led. There are indications that there is a Professor Jonathan Moyo, Zimbabwe's Minister of Higher and Tertiary Education, who also happens to be talented in terms of strategy. Lacoste, it's a faction whose ideology is rooted uh, within the liberation struggle. And G40, it's a faction which is saying those who were at the front of spearheading that liberation struggles were within their 40s. Why are we not being allowed? And there's another group asserting itself. The war veterans, Mugabe's former comrades in arms, they want a successor with revolutionary roots, not a family dynasty. There are people who have opportunities or access to resources and they will amass that wealth. I have a legacy to protect. I went to war, I fought the war, I won the war, and my people must benefit. With an election less than a year away, Robert Mugabe is already hitting the campaign trail. He's made several medical trips abroad this year, but denies any serious illness. Well, there is the issue. The president is going, I'm not going. The president is dying, I'm not dying. We asked his party spokesman why ZANU-PF insists on backing Mugabe despite his age. We nominate who we believe can continue to lead us in this revolution. And uh, so far, people have repeatedly called on him to serve. He has, of course, tried to resist, but when people continue to say, please keep on until we really feel that you cannot go further, well, that's different. As for the opposition, several parties finally agreed to form a coalition after years of fighting each other. Morgan Changarai's merchandise has already hit the shelves, but it's unclear whether the former prime minister will be Mugabe's main challenger. We are 50% uh, of, of the way. Uh, we still have uh, uh, you know, more to do, but it's a, it's, a, it's a long road. We are in Africa, so in Africa, state institutions are captured. So we are facing a, a massive uh, task 
one could say this election is almost stolen even before we participate in it. With more than half the country under the age of 30, the youth vote will be more powerful than ever. For them, a post-Mugabe future might be hard to imagine. They've never known a Zimbabwe without him. Sandra Gatman, The Newsmakers, Harare. Well, we have a panel of guests from Harare joining us now. First, there's Nelson Chamisa, Deputy President of the Opposition Party Movement for Democratic Change. Also, we've got Robert Mugabe's former Deputy Information Minister, Bright Matonga, and Ngaba Machasi. He's a news editor at Zimbabwe's biggest independent daily newspaper, The Newsday. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. Bright Matonga, if I can start with you, sir. He's 93 years old. He's been in power for 37 years. Isn't it time Robert Mugabe just stepped aside with dignity? Uh, I think we have to look at the Constitution. Yes, he's 93. <laughs> There's no need to debate about that. Uh, there is a constitutional mandate. Uh, he's been elected uh, in 2013. Uh, the term ends in 2018. And now it's up to ZANU-PF whether they're going to choose a new candidate uh, or President Mugabe will continue. But uh, the indications are very clear that the part, there is a party constitution and government constitution. The party constitution ends, I think, in 2020. Therefore, he is the only ZANU-PF candidate to stand for the president. So really, when we look at the Zimbabwe situation, you need to look at the systems and the constitution, wishes and needs... Uh, and desires, I think, they don't come into play. Yes, he's 93, but uh, yeah. Um, it is fair to say that there is need for change. We, you can't deny that. And uh, it's important <coughs> that ZANU, but it has to be done within the constitution of ZANU-PF and the constitution of the country. As it is, he's eligible, and uh, he's going to stand. And the youth and the women's league, which are the main majority uh, decision makers in ZANU-PF, You've said we right. don't have another candidate. We've got President Mugabe. Right. Let me ask Nelson Chamisa, do you believe that it's the man who has overstayed his welcome or the party? Definitely. We cannot do uh, the bidding for ZANU-PF. But what is clear is that uh, Mr. Mugabe's age has become an albatross around the neck of Zimbabwe. The people of Zimbabwe are sweating under the heat and weight of uh, not just an old president, an exhausted president, a tired president, but a president who is now out of turn and out of time in terms of the mandate to lead the people. Clearly, Mr. Mugabe has successively, successively succeeded himself. Uh, he remains his own successor. He has no intention to go anywhere. But in the <coughs> process, he has arrested the country. In the process, he has uh, manacled and shackled the country. Look at the inflation rate in the country. Look at the queues uh, that are forming on the banks. People cannot even access their uh, own hard end, uh, uh, you know, currents or right. money. Uh, we have problems in terms of the politics of the country. But tell me, uh, Nelson. No, none aligned. Sorry to interrupt you. Tell me, why is MDC the answer? The people last time still chose ZANU. Why is MDC the answer? MDC is the only answer because we provide an alternative in terms of our template for governance. The crisis in Zimbabwe is largely a governance problem. It's a leadership problem. And we are providing an alternative in terms of our governance matrix, in terms of uh, making sure that we align to the constitutional uh, dispensation that has to be uh, ushered in. We had a constitution that was brought in in 2013, 2014. That constitution has not been implemented. And and there continues to be a gap in uh, implementation of the constitution. And that governance gap, that governance crisis, what we are beginning to see manifesting in the economy, the economy itself is a reflection of the uh, attitude of those in government who are failing to provide consistency of policy. There's too much noise in the cockpit. Leadership cannot right. provide direction, vision, and that is the problem. That's why we as MDC have an alternative policy to speak to smart policies that will respond to the economy, to the institutional issues that are supposed to be handled, and also the issue of the social crisis. Bright, let me ask you. The economy has been a mess for a long, long time. It's been particularly bad for at least a decade, and the forecast is not so good. Who destroyed the economy, if not ZANU-PF? We can do the blame game. Uh, what is important is that uh, um, the economy has to tick. Things have to happen. I've been listening to Mr. Chamisa. As things stand right now, 
Zimbabweans don't have an alternative political party. They, there is disunity within the, oppo uh, within the opposition. Uh, even when, you come to, uh, when it comes to overstaying, there is overstaying of leadership within the MDC. Uh, there has been change of the constitution. And we, I think Zimbabweans don't want to change for the sake of changing. There has been elections that have been won uh, by ZANU-PF. People can say they were free but not fake. And, but yeah, the economy, there's a shortage of uh, foreign currency. We've introduced what they call the bond. That is the equivalent of uh, it's a Zim uh, dollar currency, uh, which is supposed to be at par uh, with the U.S. dollar. Uh, it's not it's trading at uh, uh, there's a 35%. Uh, that is a challenge. But really, there has to be a, a new injection of ideas, a new injection of capital. Um, so those are the things that needs to be worked on. We hope the, uh, the opposition or the coalition of uh, opposition um, they're supposed to, you know, to, to, to give an alternative. But there also seems to be disunity within the opposition. Okay, and so let's ask Nelson then. Confused. Let's yeah. ask, Nelson, why are you not unified? Well, there is no disunity. There is diversity. And, you know, the more the merrier. That diversity is very important because it's the rainbow and the mosaic um, manifestation and illustration of how we are variegated as a society and as a country. We are uniting and converging as opposition political parties. It is a process. We are almost there. We are happy that the opposition is finally coming together to focus on constructing an alternative narrative in governance, an alternative narrative in the economics of the country, an alternative narrative in terms of our relations with the international community. We want to restore Zimbabwe among us, the family of nations, and we are doing that. Clearly, ZANU-PF does not constitute an answer. It constitutes a problem. It is a question, and what we want is an answer, and the answer comes from the opposition, and the opposition is very ready. By the way, President Changrai whom he referred to as having overstayed, is one of the tried and tested leaders who have beaten Mr. Mugabe in previous elections. Elections have been disputed in this right. country, and the only candidate, in our view, who is going to again beat Mr. Mugabe is Mr. Morgan Swangrai. Now, of course, are you still the context of a united opposition. Yeah, it sounds as if you're still bitter over those events of nine years ago. If you believe they stole the election from you nine years ago, perhaps you believe that they're going to steal it next year? Am I right? Once beaten, twice shy. In fact, we have learned our lessons. We now know how to catch a thief. They've done it before. We now have mechanisms to make sure that we stop them. By the way, ZANU-PF is so divided. There are factions within ZANU-PF. You know that uh, the former vice president, uh, 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 Dr. Mujuru, moved away from ZANU-PF. So ZANU-PF is effectively split, even within. Uh, they are poisoning uh, one another. They are fighting one another. There is total war. There is elite rupture. The, the center can no longer hold. So we are also counting on that one. There are fissures and fractures within ZANU-PF. And we are going to capitalize on that one. It's a wounded, it's a wounded animal. We are hunting, and we are making sure that we will catch our, 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 our cage finally. OK, so Bright, you accused Nelson's party of not being unified. What about, the, what about ZANU-PF? What about the fact that it seems as if Robert Mugabe has even lost the war veterans, the very people he was trying to placate in order to push, push forward his uh, land reform policies and seizing white-owned farms? He's losing some crucial partners, isn't he, Bright? I think ZANU-PF is a massive institution. Uh, ZANU-PF controls all structures of government, being the parastatals, the army, the police. Yes, there are divisions. Yes, there have been uh, stories of the uh, vice president being poisoned. Yes, there are infights, the, uh, I mean, the, the war veterans. That's very correct. But I think as things stand right now, uh, week in, week out, there is massive campaign by ZANU-PF. They got this, what they call youth, youth interface, where they are oversubscribed, 60,000 youth every province. And they, we haven't seen that from the opposition. Really, as a Zimbabwean, I would like to see a unified opposition so that a party that is in power cannot sit back and relax. Okay. That is the problem that we've had for all these years. So it is important that this happens. But as things stand right now, there is a big problem. ZANU-PF, the indications are that ZANU-PF will have a landslide uh, victory. They've got this command agriculture. The, the, the you know, majority of Zimbabweans are farmers. Okay. And the, the, the have been very good. Fair enough. Yeah. You said you used the word landslide. I want to take that word 
and pose it to Ngaba Machazi. Ngaba, we lost you for a couple minutes, but you're back, and you would have heard a little bit of what the other two gentlemen had to say. Is this going to be more of the same come next year? Is ZANU PF going to win? Well, I can definite, uh, definitely say they are going to win, but there's a real danger that the opposition is in sixes and sevens. They have absolutely no clue what's going on. They are bickering amongst themselves. They have a golden opportunity to win this uh, next year, but at the present moment, they are not inspiring any confidence whatsoever. Um, they are coming together as an alliance which was supposed to be but it seems to be pulling up uh, among themselves. They are fighting Okay. themselves, as it is, even the other deputy president, uh, Chavez Kodik, okay. is also not happy with the alliance that they're trying to come up with. Okay, so Nelson, you have a golden opportunity. You're getting free uh, consultancy from Ngaba here. He's saying you have a great opportunity <laughs> come next year, but you're messing it up. What do you have to say to that? We, we acknowledge that we have uh, indeed a golden opportunity, and we acknowledge that we indeed have very strong uh, oppositional forces and political parties that are going to come together, that have already begun the process of coming together. We have an MDC alliance, which is a conglomeration or an association, a partnership of all the political parties uh, that we feel are going to build towards this momentum for a convergence. We are still to engage other political parties, uh, Dr. Mujuru's party, and other parties that are still uh, not connected to the broader alliance. What we need is a grand coalition. And we have already begun the process. But you know that um, uniting people is not an event. It is a process. We are conscious of time because we also have voter registration to kick in. Uh, and we want to make sure that by the time people begin to register, there's motivation, there's inspiration, there's reason for people to participate in a vote because there's a credible alternative. And I still would want to say, even those in ZANU-PF are aware that MDC poses a credible alternative. And that's why they are in sixes and sevens. That's why they are trying to frog much people to their rallies, which uh, my brother Bright says are being attended uh, by thousands and thousands of people. These are people who are poor, who are hungry, who are angry, who are being frog marched by dint of force into these mm -hmm. meetings, but they do not agree with ZANU-PF. They do not agree with Mr. Mugabe. They will not vote for Mr. Mugabe, clearly. They will vote for the MDC. Let me ask Ngaba the question that I asked the other two gentlemen earlier in the program. He's 93 years old. The economy has been in a mess for a long, long time. Zimbabwe was a once prosperous nation, and it's been through some very, very dark times. Will Robert Mugabe be remembered as a, a tyrant, a decent leader? Has he overstayed his welcome? How will he be remembered come next year? Well, the problem with history, it has a way of resuscitating and cleaning people's images. We have seen some of the worst detectors uh, who are now remembered fondly. The problem with Zimbabwe now is that Mugabe has shaped Zimbabwe in his own image. Even the opposition are beginning to mimic some of Mugabe's, uh, what we would not like in Mugabe. For example, Chamisa is there right now. I don't know how long his own president, his own president uh, of the party, has been in power for 18 years or so, which is almost half of what Mugabe has been there. So the problem is the nation is shaped after Mugabe's image. And... Um, it would be difficult to get whole, I mean, to rid ourselves of Mugabe's image and what is going on right now in Zimbabwe. Uh, what will be important, I think, in the next year's elections is that we cannot say Mugabe doesn't have support. He does have a meaningful support. And it's up to the opposition to take away some of Mugabe's supporters because we've only known Mugabe. And for many people, it's just natural to vote for Mugabe because that's what Zimbabwe is all about. Okay, so Nelson. The country was shaped in Mugabe's image. The opposition is shaped in Changarai's image, and he's been around for almost two decades. Isn't it time for fresh blood there as well, Nelson? Well, we are part of the Changarai team, and we are the fresh blood. Uh, we are injecting that vibrance, that dynamism, that youthfulness, which is very important. You know, it takes a team to win. Uh, President Changra is only but a leader of a team. Of course, he has been there, tried and tested. It's an advantage, not a weakness. He has been there. Also, uh, bearing in mind the fact that real power is in the state, real power is in government. So he has not been in power in any way. We have been in a struggle. We have been in a journey. Uh, and that journey uh, has been a long one. And we are almost getting there. So we should not begin to point at uh, 
uh, one another simply because the journey has taken too long. It has been a fight. It has been a struggle. We are almost get there. This is the final mile. We need all Zimbabweans to unite, rally behind a credible alternative as led by the Movement for Democratic Change, the MDC. And we have a real credible and legitimate alternative, which we feel is going to give Zimbabweans a platform for restoration, Zimbabweans a platform for real transformation and a platform for real change. Bright, let's forget the elections for a second and let me ask you very bluntly, what's going to happen to ZANU-PF and the country when the old man is no longer around? <laughs> oh, oh, you know, look, I can't comment as to <laughs> when you won't be around, but ZANU-PF <laughs> is a massive institution, as I say. It's like you, 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 you are fighting a tree, but the impression that has been given to people is like, uh, ZANU-PF is a forest, not a tree. And they've been focusing on President Mugabe, not on systems of governance. ZANU-PF is a system of governance, which is very solid, which is very strong. And um, I think as the people in Zimbabwe, yeah, they want to see a new face within ZANU-PF, but constitutionally they can't. And we just, people are just reacting to, people don't know what he's going to do next and what's going to happen next. So really, he's been very smart. He's been very shrewd. He has um, stepped on everyone's toes. And, um, but majority of Zimbabweans are in the villages. They're happy. There's food there. They're getting inputs. And of course, things in urban areas are very tough. For you can't get money for electricity, for your council rates. So it is a big challenge. We, we have to accept that. But as things stand, I can't even talk about life after Mugabe. I don't know. I, I can't. I'm not a prophet. But as things stand right now, well, I mean, we come 2018. I guess, certainly, I, you don't have to be a prophet to assume that someone who's 93 is not going to be around for all that much longer. Let me give Ngaba the yeah. final word here now because we are running out of time. Ngaba, what's Zimbabwe going to look like come next year? Are you optimistic or pessimistic? Well, a, a, a bit of both. I want to say uh, Bright's uh, characterization is very disingenuous because Mugabe is the clue that is holding the party together, is the clue that is holding the country together. So because he's been in power for so long, it's difficult to tell what the future is going to be like because, uh, like I said, his ideology is ingrained within us. Uh, as I said, the opposition is mimicking, civil society is mimicking, everyone is now behaving like the president, I think, to a point. So it's um, we're optimistic that when someone comes in, maybe there's going to be change. But there is bound to be resistance as well, because the system that Mugabe has put in for so long is very loyal to him, to a point that they might oppose anyone that wants to replace him. I think uh, Chamisa is a good example. His party... Uh, ahead of 2002 and 2008 elections, they were told we're not going to vote for anyone who doesn't have liberation war credentials. That is the nature and the systemic uh, hold on power that President Mugabe has. Okay, gentlemen, we're out of time. I wish we could continue with this conversation. It's been an important conversation to have. Nelson Chamisa, Bright uh, Matonga, and Ngaba Machasik. Gentlemen, it's been a pleasure talking to all of you. Thanks a lot. Well, our special series on Zimbabwe continues all this week. Next time, what will the country have to do to get itself out of an economic freefall? We talked to Zimbabwe's Minister for Economic Planning and Investment. I feel really very happy, feel very independent and feel free today after the decision that has been announced by Supreme Court. Uh, this should have happened long back. India has banned the practice of instant divorce, which allowed a Muslim man to leave his wife by saying the word talaq three times. The Supreme Court ruling is being seen as a major victory for women's rights. Triple talaq is actually outlawed in numerous Muslim-majority countries, and its banning in India isn't too controversial. But what is, however, is the debate it's reignited about whether different religious communities should all be subject to one set of laws what's known as a uniform civil code. It would replace the myriad personal laws which allow each religious community to practice its own laws so long as they don't violate the constitution. The system was originally sanctioned to protect different faiths in a country teeming with religious diversity. But many worry the ruling BJP party would enforce a uniform code that favors Hindu customs. So, would a uniform law guarantee equal rights regardless of religion or override the protections actually built into personal faith-based laws? 
Let's pose these questions to the spokesman for the ruling BJP party, Nalin Kohli, who joins me now out of New Delhi. Thanks so much for joining us once again, sir. So we had the Supreme Court's decision on triple talaq across the board. A lot of people, barring a few, a lot of people celebrated it as a, as a victory. It's now being seen as a precursor to talking about the uniform civil code, as they call it. Would this be good for India? The triple talaq judgment is a historic judgment by the Honorable Supreme Court of India. It has to be seen in context of the equality of rights of citizens under Article 14 of the Constitution, wherein every Indian citizen is treated equally before law. And in terms of women who had raised this issue, it was essentially Muslim women who had raised this issue. They felt that there was a discrimination, and the court has held so. It is equally important to point out that this is restricted only to the triple talaq, which is instantly saying talaq, talaq, talaq in one vote. It doesn't touch the other mechanisms that exist within personal law of Muslims, nor does it see, nor is it uh, to be seen as a comment on the Muslim laws or the personal laws per se. Now let's come to the issue of uniform civil code. Article 14 of the Constitution, Article 44 of the Constitution of the India is directed principles of state policy says the state shall endeavor to have a uniform civil code. The BJP as a party has always ideologically said that a uniform civil code is desirable because it is part of the constitutional mandate since 1950 and it is one of the constitutional objectives that needs to be done. A uniform civil code can only be a secular code that is equally applicable to citizens without it being, for example, it cannot be a Hindu code applicable to the Muslims. How can it be? Because it would be running foul of the Constitution. The Constitution itself, we must understand how India's Constitution is. The Indian Constitution says we are Indians first. We merge all our identities to become an Indian citizen. Then as Indian citizens, we are treated equally before law, which is Article 14. We have the freedom of speech, expression to carry on our profession, etc., under Article 19. Then we have Article 21, which is the free, uh, right to, uh, free, uh, right to uh, life and liberty. And then from 25 onwards, you've got certain rights, and these are fundamental rights for minorities to set up their educational institution, their matters of faith. That's also enforceable rights. The Uniform Civil Code idea comes much later in the Constitution in Article 44, which is a recommendation, an endeavor, not an enforceable fundamental right. Therefore, for anyone who says that the Uniform Civil Code is meant to be a Hindu majority code imposed on, say, Muslims or Christians or Parsis or Jews is 100% incorrect. It cannot be. A Uniform Civil Code has to be a consultative process. It is a long-drawn process. It can only be a code that is truly secular, which draws in what would be equally applicable to all citizens, irrespective. But that's an idea. There is still no move towards it. Mm -hmm. Let me give you what Nevadita Menon said, writing in The Hindu. She said, the talk of a uniform civil code has nothing to do with gender justice, obviously referring to triple talaq as the beginning. She said, it has entirely to do with a Hindu nationalist agenda to discipline Muslims, to teach them, if they didn't know it already, that they are second-class citizens and that they live at the mercy of the national race, the Hindus. How would you respond to Nevadita Menon? Well, first, I would say, under Article 19.1a, freedom of speech and expression, as I would, as every other Indian citizen would, she has the right to put her view. Second is, with respect to what the content is, I not only disagree, I consider it an extremely wrong and a rabid comment, which is far divorced from the truth. It is as rabid as people saying that every terrorist is a Muslim, so therefore every Muslim is going to be a terrorist. It's as silly as that. We need to understand it's an extreme view, which doesn't do. No, the BJP is a frontline political party. We are governing India. And as far as the prime minister has said it numerous times, the only book he swears by and will implement is the Constitution of India. Our agenda is in Hindi, Sabka Saad, Sabka Vikas, which translates in development for all, carrying everyone along. This government is the government of every Indian. It doesn't matter whether that person voted for the BJP or did not. Whether that person is a Hindu, a Christian, a Muslim, a Jew, a Parsi, a Buddhist, anything. So this why, that's why I reject that view in totality.
very finally, 70 years on, is it still a bit of a riddle for India to try and reconcile being a secular democracy, but also dealing with the reality of having hundreds of millions of Hindus, tens of millions of, of Muslims and Jains and Christians and Jews and, and so on, trying to give them not only freedom from religion under a secular state, but also freedom of religion where they feel they can practice freely. Is it still a riddle? No, I don't think it's a riddle, although I must say it's a good question. We are a Hindu majority country. But then, as I said in the beginning of this program, the fundamental start is we merged our identities to be a secular Indian with the right to profess our religions as we do. And our constitution is a living document. It's a gem of a document because it still offers us that possibility to constantly come out and enforce the rights of everyone within the constitutional scheme. So therefore, I don't think there's a contradiction, if anything at all. Okay. Nalin, it's been good to talk to you. Thanks so much for joining us. Nalin Kohli joining us from New Delhi. Next time on The Newsmakers, we debate if sanctions against North Korea are really all that effective. The evidence may show otherwise. Until then, thanks for watching this edition with me, Imran Garta. Bye-bye.